Excellent. Thanks, Jens. Uh, it might be a bit of a stretch to call this a lightning talk. I think I'm going to uh, eat into um, uh, David's time as well. So <laughs> we'll, we'll see how this goes. Uh, and this is uh, none of this is going to be specific to C++. Of course, this is just about speaking in general. So from nervous wreck to pro speaker in five easy steps, we would like lists, don't we? And even if you don't consider yourself a, like a nervous speaker, um, we, there's always room for improvement. There's always things we can learn. Most of the things that I'm going to talk about, I'm still working on. And I've counted them up recently. I think I've done about 170 talks now. Uh, I'm, I'm still learning. I'm still improving. Uh, so these are just some of the things that I've uh, I've come across along the way that have helped. So these are the, the five easy steps. We're going to break these down uh, now. So we've got uh, preparation, breathing, posture, contact with the audience, and the three Ps. We'll find out what they are. So let's start with preparation. Seems to be a good place to start. So obviously this is what's going to happen before you, you give a talk. And uh, the, the better your preparation, of course, the, the better you're going to be able to get up and, and give a good talk and be confident in doing that. Now, I've put this quote up. I'm sure you're familiar with this quote, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. And I put this up for two reasons. The first one is, no matter how much preparation that we, we do, if we've not really done much public speaking before, when you first get up and actually start trying to deliver your material, you're going to find that it feels very different to how you imagined. So be prepared for that. Don't assume that um, just, you know, you, you practicing at home and then go, getting up in front of people, it's going to work the same way. If you're prepared for that, that's going to get you a, a long way. And we're going to have some tips to try to, to work through that, to accelerate you to um, be more confident. But bear that in mind. Now, the other reason I put this up is, um, well, who, who actually originally said this? So apparently it's been attributed to uh, Helmut von Moltke uh, from 1871. Except actually he, he didn't quite say this. Um, it seems to have been a combination of these two uh, recollections from 1961, no plan survives contact with the enemy, or from 1969, uh, no plan survives the first contact of war. Put those two together. Uh, actually, neither of these things are what Helmut said either. What he did say was this. No plan of operations extends with any certainty beyond the first encounter with the main enemy forces. Um, and then all the others are just derivations of that. But the point of going through all this is to say we, we can't over prepare. It's very easy to go down rabbit holes and uh, pick on things that aren't actually that important, and I spent a lot of time researching those. Uh, and that's fine. It can actually add a bit of color to the talk like I'm doing right now. The trouble is you're likely to end up uh, running out of time for your main preparation, and then getting to your talk on the day feeling you're not quite prepared because you spent all your time going down these rabbit holes. I've been guilty of this over and over again, so I know what I'm talking about. So do try to avoid that. Uh, do try to uh, time box what you're, you're going to be uh, talking about. So you do need to know your subject well, the, the core subject. Uh, you should be uh, very familiar with, um, do extra research if you need to about that beyond what you're going to be talking about, because you're going to get questions as well. Things are going to uh, knock you off. So make sure you know that core subject well. Don't spend too, many, too much time going down those extra rabbit holes. And as I say, time box your, your research so that you still have time to actually put together the, the talk itself. Um, now, there's different ways that you can um, organize all of this. Uh, I often will make an outline um, or I'll um, just put some rough slides in and I'll tend to use comic sans so I know that these are not the final slides. Otherwise, I can be tempted to sometimes just let those through. Uh, and there's other ways to, to do that. The point is to try to be deliberate in the way you organize your material and, and get it into its final form. This is not going to be a talk uh, about that, so I'm not going to go into more depth, just have a plan, even if it doesn't survive contact with the enemy. What I do want to talk more about is rehearsing your material. Do try to make time for uh, at least a few full run-throughs of your talk, even if it's a long talk. Uh, make sure you have at least one time you go end to end. Um, that, that can be really important. But most of your rehearsal and, and practice beforehand should be not the full run-through, but actually around specific parts 
Um, so the main thing here is to really select a few key parts of your material that you really want to make sure you're very clear on this part. Know what they are up front. Spend extra time practicing and rehearsing those. And, and these key points are going to come up a few other times uh, in this material. So I want to emphasize that. Make sure you know what your key points are. Have three, four, maybe five of them at most. Uh, and everything else is just supporting those. If you've got too many key points, then you don't have any key points. So that's the, the main things you can do in your preparation to make sure that when it comes to actually giving the talk, you're going to feel prepared. And that's half the battle. So that's preparation. Now let's talk about breathing. So you might think if I'm going to talk about breathing, I'd put up a picture of some lungs. But actually, this is the autonomic nervous system. And if you've heard anything about the autonomic nervous system, you probably know that we tend to break it down into to two parts. There's actually three, but we don't tend to talk about the other one. So there's the sympathetic nervous system, which is responsible for our fight or flight response. We'll talk about that in a moment, but I'm sure you're familiar with that. And then the parasympathetic, say that again, the parasympathetic nervous system is more uh, to do with what we might call rest and digest, or I think it's more useful to think of it as just the like calming down, recovery, those sorts of things that you can do when you're not in that fight or flight mode. Now, both of these systems are active at all times, but they, they generally are going to be in a sort of a, a nice balance where neither one is, is dominant um, and they, they just come to play when needed. And evolutionarily speaking, when you enter a new situation, unfamiliar situation, there's perceived threats all around, that's going to trigger your, your fight or flight response, the sympathetic nervous system. And in an evolutionary setting, that's exactly the right strategy. When you're standing in front of a, a room of people looking at you, expecting you to speak to them, having that same response is not quite so useful. Because what's going to happen is when that sympathetic nervous system is triggered, your heart rate is going to go up. Speaking is going to become harder because your esophagus contracts. actually makes it harder to speak. You start sweating and your breathing is going to speed up. You're going to be gasping in uh, short, short gasps of air. None of that is particularly conducive to feeling uh, calm and relaxed in a public speaking setting. Uh, and this is usually what puts people off having that response and thinking, no, I can't do public speaking. But that auto in the word autonomic nervous system, well, it means automatic, which suggests that this is something that, that we can't control. You know, we are at the mercy of our sympathetic nervous system. But that's not actually true. We can control it. We can control it with our, with our inner thoughts uh, once we're, we're practiced on it. But we can also control it physically through our breathing. So eventually then our breathing speeds up when we take short gasps. But if we take control of that and we have uh, long, slow, controlled breaths, then we actually start to take control of our sympathetic nervous system and it deregulates it back down so that the, the, the parasympathetic nervous system can start to uh, perhaps dominate again. So you probably heard about that this breathing pattern, the, the long, slow, controlled breaths, you you breathe out, you hold on the exhale for a few seconds, long breath back in, hold on the inhale again. Don't underestimate how powerful this can be. This directly controls your autonomic nervous system and gives you back that control that you will feel that you're, you're lacking when you're up there in a, in a public speaking situation. To make best use of this, you're going to need to practice this regularly, ideally daily, but if you can't do it daily, then just at least doing this from time to time gets you into the habit of being able to take this control. And then do it just before your talk. Particularly if you're up there on a the stage just about to speak, that's the perfect time to take that back, that control. Get control of yourself, get control of your breathing and be ready to give your talk. Maybe even during your talk, you can find opportunities to do this. If you have a pause maybe you're doing a demo or some other time you're not actively speaking, take the opportunity to take a long breath again, get that control back. Make it a reflex. So anytime you feel like you're losing control, you now know how to gain that control back. There's obviously a lot more that can be said here. Could do a whole hour or more talk on this, but I've only got a few minutes, so I'm going to move on to the next 
item, which is posture. It's actually closely related because there's a there's a an evolutionary aspect to this. That when we feel vulnerable, we, we tend to sort of close up. So our, our shoulders will roll forward. Uh, we, we may tend to lean forward. And, and all of our body language is, is all sort of closed off because we're, we're trying to protect ourselves. And again, that's not very useful when we're trying to be open and, and engaging with our audience and, and speaking in a, in a relaxed way. So very similar to the, to the breathing. And again, similar to the breathing, we can take conscious action in the other direction. So if our shoulders are rolling forward, well, we'll pull our shoulders back, but not to make them tight and tense. So we, we need to get the shoulders relaxed. Just, just pull back. And one way you can, you can do this is um, actually if you sort of hold your hands open forwards, then naturally the, the shoulders will, will go back, but still be relaxed. And that will actually help you to feel more open, more open to the audience, more relaxed and more confident. And you'll project confidence as well. But there's another part too to posture, which can be really important as well. And that's the head neck alignment. So your head is actually very heavy. It's, uh, it's one of the heaviest parts of the body. And if you are starting to, to roll forward a bit, your head's going to come forward and it's going to start, it's going to, you're going to end up with some sort of cycle where you're, you're going more and more forwards and you're going to feel like you're not in control again. For the, for the head and neck to be aligned, the head should be above the shoulders, above the hips, above the knees and above the feet. All those things should be in line. And that sounds like a lot to keep uh, in mind. But fortunately, our, our bodies actually work such that all of that happens automatically if we just do one thing. And that's just to allow our head to uh, float forwards and up. Which sounds silly, but try it. And you'll find that everything else, if you can relax your shoulders as well, just sort of naturally falls into line. And you instantly feel more confident, more open, and more in control. And that, that's a central part of what's called the Alexander Technique, which has been known for uh, over 100 years now as a, as a really powerful technique for all sorts of performers, uh, singers and actors, and uh, anyone that has, a, has to have a stage presence, they'll, they'll study the Alexander Technique. And there's a lot more to it. That's another rabbit hole you can go down if you like. But just remember that your head flow float forwards and up. And that, that's really going to help you to open up uh, and also give that opportunity to do that breathing as well. So that's posture. We need to move on with uh, contact with the audience. So that's our next point. Now, most of this section is going to be about uh, in-person speaking. Uh, for online speaking, like I'm doing now, I found one of the best tips to, to get a connection with your audience is to have some way that they can interact with you. So whether it's through uh, some sort of a chat system, a Q and A, polls, anything like that. Now we're not doing it here because this is technically a lightning talk, but uh, normally I would have something early on, do it as early as possible, where you're gonna give me some sort of feedback, something to let me know that you're actually out there and you're listening. Because when you're speaking into the void, like I'm doing right now, it's, it could be really hard to uh, while you're thinking about giving your talk, also you're also thinking, is actually anybody listening? Is there anybody out there? Is this working? As soon as you get that first bit of feedback, it's not just that you know that people are there, but you feel it as well. And that helps you to relax. So that's the one tip I'll give for online speaking. But for in-person speaking, when you're faced with a, a sea of faces, it, even if it's a small group, it can look like a sea of faces, especially if you're, you're new to public speaking. Don't think of the audience as a big faceless mob. Instead, think of them as a collection of individuals and look at them as individuals. Look around the room at individual faces. And as you're speaking, actually direct your sentences, a sentence or two at a time, to just one person at a time. Try to go around the whole room and you will find that there are people with different levels of engagement, especially if it's in a larger room. There's always going to be somebody who looks a bit zoned out, people on their phones or their laptops. Uh, they may all have good reasons for doing so. Don't assume that you're just being boring. Just ignore those people. 
find the friendly faces. There's always going to be someone that's uh, smiling, nodding along, just actively engaged. There's going to be a few of those. Find those people and concentrate more on those. Say sentences to those. But do look all around the room, especially a larger room. It can be very tempting to just to focus on a corner of the room and to exclude the rest. But you're not going to feel connected with the audience unless you're speaking to the whole room. And doing so is also going to make you feel more in control as well. So look around the room, find the friendly faces, talk to those individuals. And don't think of them as a, as a, a mass, as of a, a mob that's out to get you. So that's connecting with the audience. One more section to get through. I think we're already over time. So let's see how, how far we can go before uh, Jens uh, pulls me off. The three Ps. I think this is um, perhaps say the, the biggest uh, practical point for actually performing the talk itself. So if you've heard of the three Ps before, you'll know they are pitch, power, and pace. And in particular, being able to vary these things. So some of us are naturally expressive speakers. But even if we are, when we get up on stage, that might change because it's a different environment. Again, it's a different skill set. And it's something that we need to consciously uh, learn about and practice and get, get your own feedback. But you can do it. You can improve and you can master this skill, public speaking, if you consider the three Ps. So stage actors know that... Um, speaking is a performance and if you've ever seen a stage actor you know that they actually exaggerate things like pitch power and pace because if they don't then it, it just doesn't come across in a public speaking setting now one way that you can tune into this is to record yourself and for a lot of people particularly those new to public speaking that's the last thing they want to do i hear people all the time say i, I never listen to recordings myself i hate it well the thing is if you record yourself and then think oh what did i do wrong and then try it again, record yourself again, keep iterating until you do actually start to see some improvement. That feeling, well, it never completely goes away, I'll be honest, but it does get a lot easier. And, and you will find that you can tolerate listening to yourself and you'll always learn something. There's always something you can improve on and it's better for you to catch that yourself and, and iterate on it. So let's have a look at the three Ps. Start with pitch. I tried to be uh, fairly brief on these. But I've actually got a lot of points. So the pitch, especially varying this, may seem the most unnatural uh, if you are new to, to public speaking. Um, again, recording yourself is one of the best ways to uh, both capture what you're currently doing and see how you can improve on it. But varying this a lot can seem very unnatural to us, especially to begin with. So concentrate on using it for a particular meaning. For example, uh, using higher pitches to convey excitement. Or if you want to get more serious, then you can take a lower tone. The important thing is to keep it varied. Obviously, don't we, we don't want to be monotonous and just speaking on the same tone. But we also don't want to repeat the same pattern over and over again, which we can often fall into if we're not paying particular attention to this. So variety is the key here. And practice is what will let us be able to do that. So power. This one is a little bit different. We, we might have to be a little bit more careful about this. By default, we want to aim for mostly a, a consistent level of sort of volume and power to our voice. Because that's going to be comfortable to our listeners. So it's usually going to be a little bit above our everyday speaking level. I, I like to think of my you know, public speaking voice as being different to my everyday voice. It's so a little bit above, but not too much that it's going to be uncomfortable. And we need to allow some headroom so that where we need to, we can add a bit of extra pump, punch to, for emphasis. Now a bit of headroom for that. Quieter levels, though, they're a bit rarer, but you can use them if you want to add a, a bit of mystery in. You know, maybe you want to share a secret with your audience. Be careful. You want to make sure they can hear you. But again, having a range of, of power built into your, your material can make it more interesting and it can make you feel more in control. So lastly, let's look at pace. Now, one of the things I struggle with the most, always guilty of, I'm doing it right now, speaking too fast. 
And there could be many reasons for this. Uh, in, in my case, it's often because I've just got too much material to get through. And so I'll naturally speak fast. And the worst part is when I don't have too much material, I've deliberately um, made less material so I don't have to speak so fast. I forget and I fall back on the habit and I speak too fast anyway and just finish early. So I'm still working on that. Um, you may also be speaking too fast if, if you're feeling a bit nervous. Uh, there can be other reasons as well. Again, it's something to be conscious of, uh, try to take back that control. But again, varying the pace can be really important. So if there's something you want to emphasize, you can really slow down for that emphasis. And if you have been speaking at a faster pace, slowing down draws attention to what you're saying. And again, not only does your audience pick up on that, but you personally start to feel, yeah, I'm, I'm in control of this situation and I'm deliberately slowing down here. And if you've just got some filling material that's just bridging from one section to another, it's okay to, to speed through that a bit faster because if somebody doesn't quite follow you, that's okay. And that can also then give that contrast for when you do need to slow down. But perhaps the most important part of varying your pace is the pause. The pause can add real dramatic effect. It can really emphasize a point you want to drill home, but it can also give you a chance to think about what you want to say next or make it seem like, you know, you're really sort of drawing attention to this particular phrase. So I'm going to emphasize the word pause again as well. It's also a time that you can take that breath that you needed. You can recenter yourself. Remind yourself of all those other things that you know, perhaps, but it's, it's easy to forget them in the moment. Take the opportunity of a pause to breathe, look at your posture, think about the three Ps, and so on. Look around the room. But also for the audience, if you're hurtling along at a fast pace, the audience is not going to be able to absorb everything, everything you say. They need those pauses to absorb and reflect on your material and to know which points they need to pay particular attention to. So don't skip the pauses. They're actually easy to do and one of the most effective tools you have in varying your pace, making your speaking more interesting and adding that dramatic effect. So that's the three Ps. Don't forget the three Ps, pitch, power and pace varying them and also good preparation paying attention to your breathing your posture and maintaining contact with the audience if you keep these things in mind you should become a pro speaker in no time at all thank you very much thank you phil that was awesome um there's one important thing for pauses which speakers should do it's very effective and it's also very good for you as a speaker. You should drink. There's always like a glass of water next to you on stage for that purpose that you drink yeah, because you will spend so much water without ever, ever noticing it. But this is like, like you know, when, when you take a break, um, that's a good opportunity. Also, like, like having title slides this is really great. Like, chapters and then every chapter has a title and you take a break and you take a drink the audience is getting ready thinking about that what i could examples anyways that was a really nice talk and i'm looking forward to the panel